So it's really nice to be back here at Lisa. Um, I actually, Lisa was my very first conference ever. Um, I was here in 1997 in San Diego. Who else here? I see a lot of familiar faces actually. Yeah, that's right. And you remember um, it was around Halloween and there was a party. Anybody go to that party? Yes, you went to that party. <laughs> nice. So I expect some verbal corrections if I get this wrong. But um, so I'd never been to a conference before. I definitely never met a bunch of sysadmins before. I had my colleagues at work. So I go to this party, and the first thing that I see is a man who has wrapped himself in saran wrap and then written TCP across his chest with a big marker. And what did he come as? TCP wrappers, yeah. So anyway, that was awesome. I felt right at home. Um, <laughs> so I kept coming back, um, came back quite a bit. So anyway, so it's really nice to be here. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for inviting me to talk about this. This, this issue has become increasingly important to me over the last few years. Um, and when I, when I think about the problem that I think that we need to solve around training and education, um, I think about scalability. And I think about um, how, the fact that we can't hire the number of people that we want to hire. And the people that we do hire, we can't seem to train them fast enough to do the jobs that we want them to do. And I, and I really do think that this is a training scalability issue um, more than anything else. Uh, and I, I can't help but think that if this problem was a machine problem, if we weren't dealing with people, we'd probably just write another tool, like the theme of this conference is about strategies and tools, right? Like we'd write a tool like CF Engine for training, and then somebody else, some crazy bike loving guy from Nashville would write Puppet, and then a volunteer firefighter, you know, working for Amazon would write Chef, and then somebody, I don't even know who this guy is, who wrote Salt, you know, we'd, we'd get all these different tools and we'd start arguing about them, figuring out what's best about each of them, and have these really intense debates about what we really ought to be doing. But I don't really see that happening. Um, we don't have these intense conversations as a system administration community about how we should be training. And I really, I really think that we should. So, I mean, when I look out and think about who really ought to be leading this charge, we've got all these companies, right? Amazon, Etsy, GitHub, Facebook, Google, Twitter. There's this company called OmniTI that has a conference. Um, and a few books out that are really great about web operations. And all these folks, they've, they've got people um, that they train, they sit out in the world, start new companies and things like that. But then there's everyone else. And there are a lot of these people who are training themselves, who are out there on their own, who aren't working for companies that we know really well. And um, I think what a lot of them do is they, they learn a bunch um, about some technology they develop a system, and then they go out and they learn some more. They don't leave behind these you know, comprehensive manuals for the rest of us. They, they move on to the next tech thing that they want to learn. Um, that's a little bit of a problem for industry. So I you know, created a survey <laughs> and asked some of my friends what they did to train their coworkers, train themselves. I got 42 responses, right? So that was thought that was pretty funny. But um, what the people said there was sort of interesting. But what they didn't say, I think, was even more interesting. So I got a few books. You know, I got a few blogs that I knew blogs that I should follow, some people maybe that I should get in touch with. But not a single person mentioned a class or a degree program. Like, there was nothing like that that they thought was good training for a sysadmin. Um, and if you think out about what we have out there in terms of scalable training, you know, we have our education system, right? Like we've got K through 12 education, we've got universities, we've got colleges, and nobody that I talk to, nobody in my circle of system administration friends thinks that you're going to get that out of a university. Uh, so what I think that all points to is that we aren't creating this type of training and we should. And I'm not sure that it needs to necessarily happen at the university level, but I think we're going to have to look to them and look at the way 
that they train and the way that they educate in order to create our own system that is going to be scalable. Um, and the reason why we need to do this right now is if you look at uh, like you know Bureau, label, Bureau of Labor Statistics or something like that, um, they've looked at industries that are growing. And uh, by 2018, they say that we're going to have another 1.5 million jobs in these computer science related uh, industries by 2018. Um, and that's an incredible job growth every year. We certainly are not producing that many new developers, that many new sysadmins, that many new web operations people every year. So I think the fundamental idea that people have in their heads is that we've got education in one world and the people who are training in this entirely separate world. And the people who are in the education world, there are not very many of them, and they're uh, you know, at universities, at schools, and they're teaching theory, and then the rest of us are over in this other world, um, other world, the practical world, implementing these technologies, using them every day, inventing new technologies, and just uh, not, and we don't really have a lot of time for this theoretical world. And I think that the, the big thing that we have to do today is think about how can we bridge that gap? How can we bring these worlds together? And that starts with thinking about the fights that we're not having with each other about these issues. We're not really talking about um, how we're going to bridge that gap. We don't have a lot of people from academia coming into our midst and talking to us about how they train people and what they need from us. And we don't often go to academia, us from the industry, and say, hey, you know, here's exactly the knowledge and skills that we want out of the students that you're graduating, rather than, you know, here's the set of technology that they don't know. We're not really engaging in those arguments. And I think, you know, uh, I, I was at the, the system in education workshop on Tuesday, and that, that workshop's been happening since 1999. And, you know, my friend Steve that was there saying, you know, we're still having the same debate. You know, we're not moving, we're not moving the conversation forward into how we're really gonna solve these problems. So if there's one thing that you take from this talk, walk out the door and do, I'd really love it if you would just pick a fight with somebody about education. <laughs> Find out what it is. You know, we pick fights about all sorts of different technology. We got VI versus Emacs. We got Puppet versus Chef. You know, we got all these other technologies that we argue about. I really think that we should start fighting with each other intensely, maybe, you know, with some insults. I don't know. Start arguing with each other about these issues. What does it really mean to educate someone in system administration? What are the core things that they need to know? And how is that separate from the technologies that, uh, the technologies that we're using every day? And what, what you should get out of that is, is an understanding of how the people around you are training and teaching the people that they know. Um, and from that understanding, I think that we're gonna, we're gonna make something really good happen. So, um, I, I want to arm you with some information, some anecdotes to uh, start these fights with. And so I'll give you an example. So when the, the training experience that I had, so I started out my career at Intel, which is a very process-heavy company. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of my background. I'm really into that uh, process-oriented stuff. But I, I started working for a consulting company. It was a virtual organization. We're spread out all across the United States. Uh, my boss was in Philly. I'm, I'm based in Portland, so I'm loving this rain today. I brought it with me. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, uh, and my CTO is in Idaho. You know, the guys who founded the company, they're in New York. So anyway, so they, they had a real need to have a clear training process from the beginning. And my first day on the job, they send me this, you know, wiki page, which is great, right? Wiki's best documentation ever. Not really. Um, so they send me this wiki page. And uh, it's numbered, you know, start from one, you know, end at like 40 or something like that. And each, each step in that is something that I need to do to get myself set up with all of the accounts and um, access to things that I need to, to do my job. And my boss, he'd check in with me, you know, it was, you know, we had a couple hour meetings or something like that, but he'd spend about 15 minutes like going over all these steps in this process that they gave me. And then the, the really intense thing that they did is, uh, so I'm a consultant at this company and I need to write timesheets, descriptions of everything that I'm doing. And so they had a very clear 
you know, explicit way of describing exactly what I was supposed to do to describe my work. And then they checked on it. And they had a couple different people check on it, my boss, like somebody else. And they gave me feedback on my sentence structure, what verbs I was using, like all this stuff. And, and they, did it, they did it right away. So I'm sure some of you are thinking about what I just described, and it's some kind of like personal hell, right? Like <laughs> somebody just looking over your shoulder all the time, like criticizing your grammar, you know? It's like you're on Hacker News and somebody's giving you crap. Um, but it was, I got to tell you, it was really, really great. Like if you break down what they, they did for me in that very first week on the job, is they gave me numbered steps and there were these measurable defined outcomes. I knew exactly what I needed to do to succeed, which is really, really important, um, really important in the beginning. They gave me explicit instruction on a task that you know, nobody really likes, documenting exactly what you did for the last 15 minutes, right? Like nobody likes doing that. But they gave me really explicit instruction and they gave me immediate feedback on what I was doing right. And they also set this expectation right from the beginning for collaboration, you know, that it was totally okay for my boss to hop in a screen. You know, we do, do screen sharing in a, in a terminal. Um, and he'd you know, be running commands or writing some code or something. And he expected me to you know, maybe not criticize, but give him feedback on what he was doing, maybe suggest something better, catch his mistakes. And he modeled that for me right from the beginning. So you know, I felt completely comfortable going and working with you know, the 20 other people in my company, sitting in screen sessions, letting them look over my shoulder, because it seemed very natural and normal there. Um, you know, all that training that they put together, it, in, it embodied the nature of the company, the core values of the company, the core values of the people that I was working with, and that was, that was really great. So like I said, as a student, I knew exactly what to do. I knew what success looked like. My boss, he asked the right questions. He made sure that I was on track and helped me if I you know, fell behind or didn't know exactly what to do. And then we had these feedback loops where he'd check in um, and catch anything that those checklists were not going to catch. So the whole system was just really set up to uh, create a great baseline for performance at this company. Um, and that's what I think that we get out of systematic training like this. We set up a baseline and we all kind of, you know, we raise all the boats. Everybody in the company knew everything in that initial training. And it was reinforced and ensured that if someone missed something, you know, their boss was going to help them, help them figure out. We also call that mastery or proficiency-based learning. So, um, so that's an example from work. Um, I also do a lot of volunteering in open source communities. One of the things I'm working on right now is this uh, group called Pi Ladies. And we um, help, there's a lot of different things that they do, but one of the things is they do very beginning, like introductory programming lessons for women. And the women that are coming to these classes, um, a lot of them don't have a great math background, don't know anything about programming, but we're, we're training them from, from the ground up. And so what we've discovered through trial and error, because of course we didn't like, you know, ask a teacher to help us, just started, <laughs> you know, by the seat of our pants, sat a bunch of women in a room and we're like, all right, go, you know, we're going we're gonna to figure this out. And so what, well, we've kind of distilled the core uh, uh, knowledge that people need before they come to these classes and are able to program, right? They need to do typing, most of them have that. They need to be able to use a text editor, which actually is a pretty complex problem, unfortunately, picking the right text editor and one that's kind of going to help them. So we spend a lot of time picking that. Um, they need to know English grammar. Most of them have a good grasp of that. They mostly just need to know noun, verb, you know, predicate kind of stuff, and we go over that a little bit. Um, they need to know variables. And sometimes this is really hard. Like, if they didn't do very well in algebra, we have to teach them what that is. Um, data structures, we definitely have to teach them, but that's, you know, there's lots of real world examples for that. And then finally, we have loops and flow control. And this is actually really easy to teach, right? Because loops, you know, in songs, so music, they listen to music, it's really easy to give them an example. And then the flow control, the if then else stuff, that's, that's really straightforward too. So they, they come to us and they have a lot of the base skills from their K through 12 education. And then we just help them a little bit with a few, with a few lessons. And then the skills, that we teach them and they demonstrate to us and to their peers, um, they end up writing a program on their own. Um, and then they come and they share that. And then they are able to debug their peers' code. They spend a lot of time doing that. We just went through a Coursera co course together on Interactive Python. And they have this little tool where they'd show their code and then run it in front of the class. Um, and, then, and then the thing that they get out of all this is uh, 
is code literacy at the end, right? They're able to actually go out and read things that are much more complicated than they're able to write at that point. And that's a pretty important skill for them to be able to evolve their programming. And this whole system, again, we're, we're working on a mastery basis, so everyone in the class rises up to this level, demonstrates to their peers what they know, um, and, and we try to get everyone on the same page at the same, you know, by the end of the course. So this is the type of training that I think that we should be doing, the way that we should be designing our lessons. You know, we identify the key knowledge that we need to get people to a certain level. We teach and fill the gaps, you know, for anybody that is coming and taking these lessons. And then finally, we have the people who are doing this, they, they demonstrate the skills that they're learning to their peers and mentors, because that's, that's where everything kind of gels, right? You take the time to show people what you learn, and then you have to explain it. And we all, I think, kind of know that intuitively. <clears throat> but if we did this, if we changed all of our training to be in that model, right? We would be going for something from something uh, my husband likes to call, I covered it, it's up, them to, uh, up to them to learn. Um, and we move to uh, thinking about this in terms of if I, I didn't teach it, or I'm sorry, if they didn't learn it, I didn't teach it, right? And that's a pretty substantial shifting, shift in thinking. Because a lot of the documentation that we have out there, a lot of the books that you'll get, they're really on the, I covered it, it's up to you to learn model. You know, they give you a wall of text, you read through it, and then you kind of fumble along and try to figure out what, what they were talking about. Um, and the, the training materials and books that go with this other model, you know, where they have follow-up questions, they have these checks for understanding, they, they, um, they circle back and have these feedback loops. Those are the ones where you really, um, really learn it as you're going through it. And you struggle a lot less. So I'm really excited because I think that there is grassroots training that is headed in this direction, um, lar large, larger grassroots training programs that are headed in this direction. So the, the first one that some friends turned me on to is um, called linuxtraining.be. It's a consulting company out of Belgium. And they decided to take a curriculum that they teach um, for a fee. Uh, they decided to publish that curriculum online. Uh, and they put it on GitHub, and I, I believe it's Creative Commons license. I'm not, I'm not sure at this moment. But anyway, it's on GitHub, so you could fork it. Uh, and some friends of mine that work at the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, they were having trouble with the student employees coming in because they didn't have a lot of experience with Unix. You know, maybe they were good troubleshooters. Maybe they'd, you know, worked... Um, you know, in, in their high schools, uh, fixing Windows machines or Macs or something like that, but they didn't have a lot of this core uh, Unix experience that they needed before they were given root, you know, on these systems. I don't know, uh, the open source lab they've supported, you know, like Drupal.org and the Linux kernel and stuff like that, so these students are working on real, uh, real systems that need to stay up, so they need, they need a little training first. So they set them down in front of this, and what they found was that uh, the kids were coming out of this with really great skills um, that then the like two sysadmins who are running this entire infrastructure then could build on with them. So I, I really like that and that comes highly recommended. And then there's this other program called Ops School um, that's just getting started, just getting off the ground. And rather than just publishing uh, training material, I mean they've they've got an outline and they're filling information in there. The goal of this um, started by a couple engineers uh, out of Etsy the goal of this is to create a learning community and bring together a bunch of different people's, different companies' trainings and goals and try to you know, get, get a group of people working in the same direction on this type of training. So what I'd be thinking if I were you in the audience right now is exactly what can I steal from what they have um, to help out my own company. One of the speakers during the education workshop talked about, they, they, had, they had some training um, for uh, site reliability engineers. And uh, when they were done with this training, which was kind of designed to bring people from you know, maybe a different skill set up to the level of an SRE, um, once they were done, the existing SREs had a look at that curriculum and they were like, huh, there's some good information in there. Maybe I should go take these classes. And what they found was they were able to kind of fill in gaps for people, level everybody up with that, you know, what was meant to be kind of introductory through advanced material. 
Um, and I think that you'll find that some of the stuff that's coming out of both of those programs is great, great for that. And then I also want you to think about what could your company contribute back to these efforts? Because there's such diversity in our industry, um, and there's a lot of different problems that we have to solve. And the only way that we're going to get information about how to solve them is, is directly, really, from you. So yeah, so that brings me back to the shift in thinking that I, that I think that we need to have. Um, go back to my, my picture here of, of these two different worlds of education and training. We've got this education over here. It's theory. There's these snobby teachers. These, these lectures to giant groups of people like what I'm doing right now. Um, there's the practical training over here in this other world, the stuff that we do every day, right, where we sit down one-on-one -on -one and we um, you know, mostly have self-paced uh, learning that we're doing. It's very practical, though, and meaningful and directly applicable. And you know, as, as I have been thinking about this, um, I realized that I, I had kind of an error in the way that I divided up these ideas in my mind for a really long time. And I think that the, the, what I was ascribing to education was really just a lot of bad teaching. And a lot of the training that I've gotten in my life has been really great, right? So if I think back to my bachelor's degree, um, I, I had this terrible, terrible class. And this was right about the time when I decided I was going to become a sysadmin. Um, and I was in this class, and the professor <laughs> His, his assignment was to take this Stephen McConnell book on software engineering and uh, read four chapters and summarize it. And that's what we did week after week. And any of you who have gone to grad school might be familiar with this style of teaching. <laughs> just hand you the book and you got to read it and summarize it. And anyway, so I'm like sitting here and I'm looking at that and just thinking, this is ridiculous. This is the most boring thing ever. I'm, I hate this. And then on the other hand, I had this great job. I was working at the computing center. Um, I was learning about uh, Linux security. I was breaking into machines, which is awesome. Um, you know, I was getting in trouble, which was also great. You know, and I wasn't getting fired, which was the best. And, uh, you know, and I, I was able to learn really interesting skills, apply them right away, and then get feedback you know, well, if I did something right, more when I did something wrong. But anyway, the, you know, that, that was a fantastic experience. I was like, oh man, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I don't want to summarize friggin' books and read stupid stuff I don't care about, you know? And, but really, like, what was going on there, like I said, is this just terrible teaching? Um, I don't know how many of you here have heard of Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, usually we see it as a pyramid here. I like this picture better. But anyway, um, so down at the bottom, you know, we've got these really, the, the fundamental skills, the fundamental things that you need um, to learn, right? You need to, uh, understand and remember some things about uh, what you're trying to learn. So in that engineering class, that's all we did. <laughs> we just memorized facts and then regurgitated them. Um, we never got to that creating and evaluating stage that I was, I had every day in my job. Like it was such a great learning environment. Um, so I, I really think that we've already kind of figured out how to create that learning environment, right? Like I, I talk to uh, a lot of, you know, I've got a colleague here, Steve, in the audience. Um, he works at the University of Oregon, and they have student training programs there, and he teaches a class there. And that learning environment still exists there. Um, at the Portland State University, they have this thing called CAT. You know, they invite students in. They have to come in on a Friday night, actually, for like uh, three or four months or something like that. Um, every week to learn about the systems, to get trained up, and they, they learn in this like real world kind of experiment environment where they get to try things out and break things. Um, and then, you know, OSU, OSL, I mean, again, similar kind of environment. They send the kids out there, give them real tasks to complete. Um, it's that, it's great learning. So we figured out like how to create those. We just haven't really figured out how to share all of the stuff that we're learning in those environments. So, so anyway, I, I really think that we needed to start thinking about this in terms of good and bad teaching and not the separation between the education world and our training world. And <laughs> this is how I think we come together. Um, we got our knowledge and skills, this base of knowledge and skills that's in common um, across the board, right? Like whether you're uh, at the university or in your job, there's, there's a core set of knowledge and skills that I think that we all kind of know. 
Um, we haven't necessarily all agreed on what those are, but you know, deep down, I think, I think we do mostly agree. And then if we were to kind of classify the bits of training and education that are out there, if we were to start to divide it up a little more, we'd have these technical competencies over here, these specific technologies, you know, whether that's you know, for a particular kind of router, you know, a particular uh, mail server, something like that. You know, we've got these technical competencies over here, but then we've got the habits, you know, the habits of what makes a great sysadmin, the things that you do in your job that make, you know, make this a profession, uh, a profession that we love, and well, most of us anyway, love it. Um, and that, that, that defines us. Uh, separately. So if we started looking at all of this material that we have out there inside our companies and kind of divided it up like this, started classifying it like this, I think it would be a lot easier to share. Um, and I think we'd find a lot more agreement when we're having these conversations. So I, I think that's the foundation of creating some great reusable lessons about what we're all doing for a living. And I've got, um, you know, colleagues, professors that are doing this already. I've got a great, great friend who I'm always looking for um, Postgres, because I, I work in the Postgres community. I'm always looking for professors who use Postgres in their classroom. And a lot of them don't do it for exactly what we were describing, right? They don't want to teach, you know, they don't want to pigeonhole their kids into one technology. You know, instead what they'll do is they'll be like, oh, let's write a database from scratch, because everybody does that every day, right? Um, but uh, anyway, this one professor is really great. He uh, takes uh, these lessons about data modeling. And instead of just using what comes in a lot of textbooks, which is like, you know, something like, you know, maybe you'll make a library system from scratch or something, he'll, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but uh, he, he instead has them go out and scrape data from election websites. So they'll go scrape all this data, create a data model, and then draw maps. You know, they'll ask questions about this data. They come up with these questions themselves, and then they publish these maps, and they share them. And it's such a great transformative experience, right? Because they're, they're taking this, you know, this, this uh, thing that they know about data modeling, and they're applying it to something that um, affects them, affects their world and their communities, and then, and then they're sharing with each other what they learned about it. Um, it's great, great stuff that's out there. So if we focus on those knowledge and skills, and then you know, secondarily talk about the habits, habits and competency, I think that we'll come up with a lot better lessons that are, that are much easier to share. So that's, that's what I think. That's, that's uh, uh, how I think we're going to come up with authentic, scalable teaching. We're going to take the good teaching, the stuff that is addressing the whole of the Bloom's taxonomy, getting, getting people all the way up to the point where they're creating things. Um, and then we just need a system to plug that into, right? I don't know that we really have that system right now. I mean, we have the university system. If we actually knew more teachers, if we were engaging more with teachers, we could probably tap into that system a little better. But we also know each other. We're here. We're at LISA. Um, we have organizations that try to do this for us, whether that's certifications or the conferences or whatever. Um, but I think a big part of it is, is seeking out teachers who understand learning theory, who understand these, uh, you know, addressing the entire stack of, of uh, you know, something like Bloom's Taxonomy and engaging with them so that they can help us make our, uh, our training, uh, help us make our training more shareable and then with that more scalable. So I said at the beginning, I want you to go out and pick fights with people. And um, uh, an important thing about fighting and arguing is uh, that there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. So I'm going to model for you the right way, and I'm going to model for you the wrong way. Um, and first, first we have the right way. Uh, there's been some really great conversations. Unfortunately, I missed the big hallway uh, discussion last night about education, but I'm sure that we could reenact it with some alcohol and um, a hallway uh, today. <laughs> um, but some of, the, some of the things that people have brought to my attention in the last couple of weeks, um, as I've been kind of working out the details of what I was going to say today, um, there's, there's this debate right now over whether ethics or risk reduction are the most important things to teach people, right? There's this fear that at some point somebody's going to do something terrible with a computer that, you know, causes a death or, you know, whatever. And um, how are we, as an industry, 
going to deal with that? You know, is there going to be some regulation that comes down? Are we prepared to handle that? Versus, you know, what are the ethics of system administration? And there's some documents out there that have already been kind of written about this, right? But do, do all the people who are in our profession really know these things? Um, and there's some stuff about privacy, all, all kinds of things wrapped up in that. Another, another question that's out there, you know, are master's programs or K through 12 standards more valuable? right now for our industry? Should we go out and be teaching you know, kids who are 12 to 18, or should we be kind of addressing older people, um, older being you know, probably older than 20? Should, you know, where, where should we be focusing our efforts right now um, in developing curriculum? And finally, this question of certifications, which is always really fun. Um, you know, where, where's the nonprofit for the trusted nonprofit, right? for certifications in our industry. And this is not just a problem that system administration has, right? This is a, this is a huge problem in the developer, uh, software developer world as well. There's not really this objective measure of are you a good software developer? Uh, so, so those are some great arguments that I think, some fights that you can pick with people and find out what they think. Here's some examples of some arguments that are not worth having. I'll just let you read that and enjoy that. Um, and I think the key difference, the thing that I wanted to show you here is that um, the arguments that are worth having, this is actionable, right? Whether or not you agree with whoever you're arguing with, you can go out and do something about each one of these things. It's specific, there's some details. These, what are you gonna do? You're not gonna change anybody's mind, right? I mean, maybe you will if you're a lot more persuasive than I am, but um, you know, this, you're not gonna change anybody's mind. You can't do anything about this stuff, so. You know, don't, I wouldn't even engage. All right, so I think you all now probably uh, have things that you could go out and do um, to make the training in your companies better right away. And I think that if you just ask these three questions, that takes you really far uh, along the path to having comprehensive, great uh, training, great onboarding. For your company. So the first question is, is my training process written down? <laughs> Great first step. Um, and I also make them numbered too, but I'm like that, I like things numbered. Um, second question, can the person being trained incrementally improve the training process? Are they able to edit things? Are they able to add things? Um, can they give feedback to someone as they're doing it? And then the third thing is, are there clear outcomes and expectations from that training. Does someone actually go in and check, you know, that they, that they learn what they were supposed to learn? And, um, and are, are the outcomes, are, are they clearly defined? Is that an achievable goal in that training? So how many of you here, this is, you're like, yes, I'm doing this in my training today? Yeah, all right. Now keep your hand up for a minute. Yeah, those of you, okay. So how many of you have shared that training outside of your company? As of today, yes. And I think you actually did it in terms of a pull request to off school, yes. I hope. Yes. And so the rest of you, I think there were two of you. <laughs> um, no, there were three. Send a pull request to off school. Go on GitHub and send them your training material because you're already set up to share this stuff. And we would love to have this there. Avlene and Patrick are here. I don't know if they're in the audience. They had to go back today. Oh, you're here too. OK. Oh, awesome. Sweet. Uh, so there are some other people who are involved in op school that you can track down. Um, and what we're trying to do is get information there. So those of you who um, are not quite as advanced, <laughs> I, would, I would love for you to think about, if, you, if you're going to do this, if you're going to go and write down your training process and create some create a system for this in your company. Think about how you could actually share that, because this is how we're going to build up the curriculum for our industry. We can't wait for somebody that's not in our industry to make it up for us, right? Like We, we need to do this ourselves, because we actually are the ones that know how this works. Um, and things are moving fast enough. Um, we invent new technologies. We are using those technologies right away. We're the ones that are going to need to document it and then share it. So obstacle is a great thing. Uh, they also have a mailing list. So if you're just interested in uh, you know, being a fly on the wall and watching as things evolve, please, please join. 
And the last thing that I, I wanted to close with is, um, I'm not sure, how many of you here have heard of computing in the core? Like almost nobody. Oh, wow. Oh, couple. Nice. Um, so computing in the core is a group of people who are working on getting computer science uh, recognized as part of essential for our core curriculum. So there's this thing, uh, core curriculum standards that are evolving in the United States, and uh, computer science is not mentioned in them currently. So they're trying to get that to be part of it, because there's this problem with computer science education in K through 12. Um, the, the underlying problem is, is that there really isn't a standard. And you go from state to state, and, and each state has crazily divergent views of what computer science is. There's not certifications, and it's usually considered an elective, sort of like the way that shop or home ec or something like that would be considered. So what they want to do is they want to change that so that computer science, you know, and it's very well defined, it's a great uh, program, computer science gets recognized as a core requirement the same way that math and the sciences are. So if you believe in this, if you think that this is an important issue, I really encourage you to go to this site and find out a little more about it and then tell your senators, your congressmen, how you feel about this, because the legislation is changing now. It's happening in the next like year and a half. Um, so now is, is a great time to let your voice be heard about this, because it, it does ultimately affect us all. So hope people have questions. I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. There's microphones. So I think I've done this kind of training as you suggest. And the biggest thing I have with it is it's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> so yes. universities can teach 150 people. You know, you can teach a class at a lecture, maybe one or two TAs. When we were doing this, we had a class of 10 with one lecturer, maybe two, two or three TAs, an administrator who was checking up on the students and, and the like. So it's almost a four, uh, yeah, like a, a two or three students to one to teacher ratio, and that's expensive. It's very expensive, yep, yeah. No, it, it, ultimately, giving our, uh, our ideas and our uh, curriculum over to professional teachers, I think that's gonna be way more efficient. I think we figured that out as a society, right? That's why we have schools. So yeah. one thing that can help um, is volunteer mentors. So if OpSchool can register professional sysadmins who are willing to mentor people, let them ask questions, we can actually do this a lot cheaper, reasonably distance education. Uh, you, you need more than just training materials that can, people can read through in exams. You're gonna need a shoulder to cry on, someone to offer a clarification, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a great idea. So they're setting up a, I'll just um, write ideas down, right? Can you go through the mic? Can you identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry, yes. I'm John Looney in Google. I was dean of our SRE University internally. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Phil uh, Farrell, and I work at Stanford University in one of the smaller departments. Um, I was just kind of reacting to your ideas about the overlap in education and training and putting knowledge and skills first as your core thing, and then habits and, and whatever the competency is, the other ones. Um, I'm thinking back to, I've been in this field for 27 years, and I'm thinking back to what education did I have that was most useful? And it was my high school physics class. Because what did he teach? He taught the scientific method. He taught you know, paying attention, observing closely, controlling your variables, uh, making hypotheses, testing them, writing up your conclusions. And this is the kind of skill I use every day as a system administrator. Yeah. And what I know about this router or this operating system, that's really less relevant because I can, there's reference books, I can see that. So I guess in my experience, I would put um, teaching this sort of method of thinking is the most important thing. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of research to back that up, right? The, um, if you're interested in the um, educational literature about computer science and teaching computer science, there's this thing called computational thinking and a whole curriculum around computational thinking that's worth having a look at. It's great, great program, totally agree. Yes. 
Okay, I'm uh, Barry Petticord. I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University with research in computer science education specifically. Oh, awesome. Um, so one thing, you mentioned Coursera. I was wondering if you see massively open online courses as being a, a reasonable um, place to kind of attack and uh, introduce these sorts of, um, you know, these sorts of system administrator training. Yes, I definitely do. I, I think, so my experience with Coursera is that it's a great foundation. It's a great place to start for people, but they really struggle with the details because most of them are coming to these classes without having, um, they, they need basically a lot of gaps to be filled in. So the way that we're handling it, uh, several of the Pilates chapters did this. They had students sign up, you know, and we've, we've had about 20 women uh, sign up to take the class together, and then we meet once or like it's actually been twice a week. I've been meeting with people um, for the last eight weeks to go over uh, the details that are just kind of missed in the class. Because it's, it's a pretty good environment. You know, they have forums where people can ask follow-up questions and stuff like that, but it's really not the same as being able to sit in a room with the other people who are struggling with it and really have people go through the details with you. So I think it's really great. There's actually this... Um, Great article by Clay Shirky that just got that he just put out um, talking about how Coursera and edX are going to eat the lunches of all the middle middle tier universities it 's like a sad day in Mudville for all middle tier universities but um, really interesting stuff there and I, I think he 's probably at least partially right about that uh, be sure to read inside higher ed 's uh, rebuttal on that <laughs> oh really yeah yeah no all I right. totally thank you for the talk it was wonderful yeah thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Mark Lamarine. Um, my only credentials with respect to teaching is I've taught children's theater for almost 20 years. Oh, that's um, awesome. And my interest in education is that I have daughters who I'm raising, hopefully, to be really good geeks. Um, a, a pet project that I expect to fail in every way that I have right now is that I'm, I'm buying Raspberry Pis and trying to figure out if I can create a lab that I can put in my daughter's high school where the kids spend 10 weeks playing with it, and I have to figure out how. And yeah. at the end, they, they get to go home with a pie and, um, and know how to hook it up to their network and make it work. And my goal, because I'm a system administrator, is to teach system administration, not Raspberry Pi or, or any of that. What, is anybody else doing anything like this? Is, is, am I wasting my time? You are definitely not wasting your time. That is an awesome idea. Um, there, so I'm getting more and more involved in the Python community, and there's, um, there is a group of people who are trying to do, I think on a smaller scale than what you're, uh, you, you are a bit more ambitious, uh, but I think that they would be super excited to work with you. So if you just give me your, you know, let's connect, okay. and I'll, I'll connect you with them. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. I mean, it's kind of like what people do with Mindstorms, right? Yeah, well, the, actually, that's the, the, yeah. the problem I have is I went to the school and I said, I, you know, here are my credentials. I work at Red Hat. I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. I have this thing I think I'd like to offer. And they said, well, we already have Mindstorms. Oh, yeah. Y yeah. <laughs> Whatever. And, and I'm like, um, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, if you don't want what I'm doing, great. But, yeah, and that might be just like finding the right teacher. Right? Yeah. Finding the right teacher to, but, to work with. Okay. Cool. That's a good idea. Ben Cotton from Purdue University. Um, so I'll start this out by saying the LISA attendees are probably not a representative sample of the um, community writ large. But one of the things I've noticed is that because so many <laughs> sysadmins are bootstrapped, you know, they came up because they, they learned on their own tinkering, there's a lot of distrust of you know educational requirements and certification programs. So how do we change the community and change their perception in order to make you know this kind of work acceptable to the current sysadmins? Uh, I think probably by producing a certification system that doesn't suck. I mean that's probably step one. <laughs> Sorry, that was really blunt. But um, I you know I think that that. Despite that hostility, which I'm going to say hostility because I think it is pretty hostile, the environment uh, in the way that people talk about certifications. Uh, despite that hostility, I think that people are very practical. And I hear people talking about, say, for example, the Red Hat certification. You know, and they're like, you know, actually, if somebody passes the Red Hat certification, they're actually pretty good. You know, and you hear people say stuff like that, and so then you want to find out, you know, what is it about that certification that makes it good? And can we find a way to... <coughs> turn it into something that a nonprofit 
um, can be the administrator for. And you see that in, in most other industries, right? There is a nonprofit organization. We talked about FINRA, which is like a financial uh, broker certification. I don't know if I said that exactly right. But um, anyway, they, you end up in the industries where they need this. You end up with a nonprofit as a holder of it because then you, know, you can trust that organization not to be biased. So I, I, I think that's probably the direction that we have to go, but it does start with having a certification that people see value from. Thank you. Hello, I'm Corey Leaning Hainer from Los Alamos National Laboratory. We recently had a recruiting meeting where we were trying to figure out how to uh, open ourselves up to more people and, and more diverse people, and we were noting that among the system administrators that I work with, we have a very wide variety of backgrounds. There's somebody who is a PhD in physics, and somebody who was going to med school, and somebody who was a, a jazz pianist originally. So, um, and then they all fell into system administration uh, eventually. And I think that's that's relatively common in the system administration world, having a very different background and then going and running machines. So I'm, I'm wondered, wondering if you have thought about the loss of that diversity if we were to move towards more of a formal training and, and uh, something that gets, puts you on a track towards system administration. I mean, maybe I'm just like really naive, but um, I, I, I actually think it's going to increase diversity. And I base that on my experiences offering training for people who have no background in programming. Uh, when we offer people a system that they can tap into, regardless of their background, if they have any interest in it at all, they're like, oh, so if I just follow these eight steps, you know, like, then I can get a much better job than my crappy administrative assistant job. You're like, yes, and they're like, okay, I'm in. You know, they're, they're, they go for it. Um, I do think it will change the culture, you know? I mean, having different... But you know we already kind of have that. We already have to kind of deal with that diversity. So I don't I don't think it's too big of a, a deal. But I, I do believe that by creating a system that people outside our industry can recognize as as a viable career option will just increase the overall diversity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Matthew Barr from Snap Interactive. I actually work in industry at this point. So from an outside of the education field. The mm -hmm. reason that we look at certifications is iffy in a lot of cases yeah. are there's very little, and the ones that actually do get represented well are the ones that have the most in-person on you know, actual systems and troubleshooting yes. components. Yep, it's so the true. most expensive ones. Yep. I pretty much don't trust almost any certification unless it's for something that I think should be on a test. Yep. Uh, unless it's a real-world troubleshooting design, like the CCIEs, um, I mean, VMware's that they just now have has actually sounded interesting at the mm -hmm. highest level because it's yeah, a paneled yeah. discussion, things like that. In terms of nonprofits, there has been some stuff in certifications that have been done, uh, especially even amongst the organizations here, but it was quite a while ago, and it went interestingly. There's a lot of history there. You can go find out about it. <laughs> I don't know too much about it, so I'll just, you, you know, probably want to look into it. Face. I think the, it was the SAGE certification process years ago, and yeah. it's relatively hard from what it looked like from the outside. Yeah, no, it's super hard. And, you know, I, I put that list of companies um, up at the beginning of my talk sort, sort of as a hit list. You know, these are the people that, that probably should be contributing money to a nonprofit that were to do this. Because, uh, yeah, it doesn't come for free. It is very, very expensive. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Carolyn, and I'm not from anywhere. In the discussions about education and training for sysadmins, it seems like some of the problem with the discussion is FUD. It's, it's, people are worried that if we come up with a way of classifying sysadmins with an education or having some kind of certification, it means all the people in, at this conference who don't have an education and aren't certified will be left out. So whatever we do, we need to make sure that all the qualified people who are here today and in our industry still have the ability to get a job without the education, without the credentials that we may come up with. I think that's a significant barrier to solving this. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, that, that is an uh, interesting question. Like, should everyone need to be certified? You know, or, or I, you know, I, I don't 
have a fully considered opinion on that, but I would say that I probably lean more on the side of getting everyone certified and coming up with a certification that the people who are the troubleshooters who can do that in-person troubleshooting that companies really value um, for whatever operating system it is that they're doing. Like, I, I think that if you can prove that you have that skill, you know, for example, like that could be part of it. Like, I, I don't know. I, I agree. It's a really hard problem to solve, and people will object to it just on the grounds of that alone, that they don't want to have to do that. I don't know who was first. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I have another concern about certification is, oh, my name is Richard Loken. I'm with Athabasca University in Alberta, Canada. Okay. And uh, I work with people from every corner of the planet. When you go look at doctors and engineers, they're driving cabs. So if you're going to come up with a certification, it better not be a guild. We already have a college of physicians and surgeons. It's a guild. It, you're, you know, because I come here from Pakistan, I should be able to get a job without spending three years driving a cab. And that is the problem I see with certification, other than the fact I don't qualify for it. Thanks. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Branson Matheson. I'm with NASA. Um, so I've been organizing some online training and centralization of information for system ends at, uh, at, for agency-wide. Um, and one of the actual, <laughs> one of the interesting things we have is because NASA has such a diverse um, uh, set of software and systems that we have, yeah, oh my God. there really isn't a lot of standardized training that can apply to our environment. So we're having to develop a lot of our own training um, for weird, weird software uh, load load systems that have to run on Windows NT and still have to exist things of that nature, VMS machines. We still have PDP 1133s in operation. So Sweet. making sure that we have people that can come in, because a lot of the graybeards are starting to, you know, like Adam, retire. And we're trying to, um, we're trying to find ways. <laughs> Sorry, we're, no I can't worries. laugh very loud. We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's be exactly accurate in everything oh, sorry. we say uh, here. So. Great ponytail. Um, so we're trying to bring, we're trying to find ways to do that, and that's been a real challenge for us. So I'd be interested in how you might address that thing, because when you talk about training and education, you're talking about a fairly standard uh, baseline, as you put it, yeah. for things. You know, Linux, Solaris, Windows, whatever. How are you going to deal with the with the uh, corner cases? <sighs> right. Um, well, I would say that our tools for this are terrible. Uh, our documentation tools are really awful, and there needs to be some kind of <laughs> evolution in the user interfaces for these things. Like, the, the best tool that we have for this is a wiki is, um, I think, a crime. Uh, you know, and so, so I think that one aspect of it is tooling. You know, we need to have some better tools for creating the documentation and then using it and evolving it. Um, but, you know, for you guys, I mean, I think a lot of companies are actually in a similar boat, the, the bigger, older ones. I mean, when I was at Intel, we had a lot of systems that were kind of like what you're describing, these ancient things that we had to keep, uh, keep going because they were the only, you know, piece of hardware in existence, basically. Uh, and, yeah, I don't, I don't have, like, this awesome, easy answer for it other than our, our tooling sucks for documentation. So if NASA came up with a really great user interface, for making better documentation, that would really help our industry. Yes, that is awesome. I have somewhat of a response to the the last question, actually. Um, I, I'm Ray Yip. I work at for Sony Gaikai. Um, I, I think today, with with cloud computing, there, there's at least a chance that if we have the right emulation um, software, that we have um, sandbox environments that we can use to train on uh, various types of software. You know, there, there are VMS emulators. You can, you can log into them and stuff like that. You can get some baseline training of uh, different environments that way, at least. Um, I've, in particular, have been interested for a while, but I haven't had time to work on um, making something that's more like a flight sim for um, specific uh, failure scenarios. So uh, actual fail failure scenarios where um, a, uh, 
you know, you, you have a root disk that's failed and you're trying to figure out, you know, how that impacts the system. Yeah, or that would be Or a performance failure s scenario or something like that. Yep. It's, it's a, you know, it's something that you don't run into except once in a while, hopefully. And um, it, depending on the, the complexity of the system, it, it's quite hard to, um, to replicate in, in an environment, that, in a controlled environment. So what you have to do is simulate it. And um, uh, there are various techniques you can use to try and do that. Uh, but yeah. a lot of it involves gathering data from the actual incident that you're trying to simulate. Right. Yeah, that, that is a fantastic idea. One of, the, one of the things that I threw out sort of as a joke in the um, education uh, workshop was that we should have broken virtual machines that we share on Amazon and then hope that people don't use those you know, to actually run systems, but um, I'm sure we could mark them, you know. Anyway, uh, I, I think that's a really great idea. It reminded me, actually, I was watching some really terrible television last night, and they were uh, showing people who, you know, before they do their first, like, helicopter flight, like, one of the things that they have to do is get into a pool with some other guys and get in this, like, harness thing, and they have to get themselves out of this cage, you know, simulating a crash, basically, a water, a water landing. Um, and so what they do, they set the guy in there, they get him all ready, you know, they train him how to do it, and then they flip him upside down. So he's upside down in the water, and he's got to get out of this cage before they let him go uh, fly his first flight. And I, I think that that's like a good, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we need to do, right? Well, maybe not drown people or simulate drowning, but, you know, like we need to put them in these broken environments and, and, you know, try to help them experience what that's like before it happens. But that wasn't my question. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Actually, I was just, you know, wondering, a completely different topic. Um, what, uh, Cory Doctorow a while ago wrote an article about how we should be teaching our kids regex. What do you think? Oh, God. Uh, I mean... Maybe, maybe, I, you know, when, when people the, single The idea out, is that, you know, if you, you learn, you, you teach them young, you can treat it as a game, and um, they, they kind of get a better sense of it early on rather than later when it's... Uh, yeah, it's like a language, right? Yeah. I mean, right, it's sufficiently, you know, self-aware at this point that, <laughs> right? You know, that... Uh, but I, I, think, I think that's a great idea, actually, to teach kids that. Um, I, I honestly think that anything that parents choose, like that some specific technology that they're really passionate about that they teach their kids, if they do that, that's the lesson for the kids, right? That there's some really cool thing that my parent loves that they taught me. And, you know, I, I don't know that the specific thing that you teach is that important. It's that the kid's like, oh, right, there are these awesome technologies out there and my parent taught me how to do this cool thing. Hi. Um, Colin Hicks from Edinburgh University, but I'm not a teacher. Okay. Uh, this was about how to, um, an answer to how to train people up to deal with that weird stuff that NASA has. Okay. And <laughs> I think the answer is that you don't specifically. Uh, I think this is where uh, the argument for, for teaching things like a deeper understanding, your theoretical framework, and generics come in. And, and you should put quite a lot of that stuff into your, into the basic program that you teach everybody. So they're, they're, in, they're, they're ready to go on and, and maintain the weird stuff that everybody has. Everybody's got corner cases somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's generally true. I do think that there's um, unfortunate stuff, though, where the tool or machine that you're working with is ancient and defies all logic. And then... <laughs> and then you want to you wanna have that, you know, crusty piece of paper that somebody spilled coffee on that tells you exactly what to type in to stop the nukes from launching or whatever. Yeah, yeah but you can't train everybody to do Yeah, that. you can't. I agree. It's good if, if you have the, found, the fundamentals and you decide not to type things in and press enter before verifying that what you're doing is disastrous, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yes. Hi, it's Carolyn again from nowhere. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what Branson said. He was talking about his crazy environment and relate that to education because last night some people said some cool things that I don't want to lose. One was comparing sysadmin to engineering and saying, well, when you get an engineering student out of an engineering school and you hire them, you expect that they know nothing. They've learned how to learn and they have some foundation, but they don't understand the environment they're about to go in. You have to teach them. 
sysadmin is probably about the same. So even if you yeah. get an education in sysadmin, you're not gonna get hired somewhere and immediately know everything. The person you hire, you're still gonna have to train them. And then that goes to a comment that Steve Vandeveener said in the workshop, which is you want us to educate these people on sysadmin, but you expect us to train them on all this weird proprietary crap that you have at your organization. How do we know how to do that? Because it's your weird proprietary crap. <laughs> so all they can do is give them that foundation, and then you've got to teach them the weird proprietary stuff right. and all the legacy systems. Yep. Yeah, and as those foundational technologies are changing, we need to be having a feedback loop with the institutions of learning, right? And that's where our responsibility really comes in, I think. Yes? I'm Greg Woods from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We have quite a few complex systems there, and we have a lot of systems where there's only one person who really understands how the system works. And yeah. so we have a very strong need for cross-training to train each other. Um, and the, it hasn't happened, and we've had this problem for a couple of decades now. And the reason it hasn't happened is the obvious one. Nobody has any time to work on training because yeah. we always have all this other stuff to do. Yeah. So recently, we did have a major disaster, an unplanned power outage in which oh. a, a number of systems went down and didn't recover by themselves. And it, it took a long time to recover from this. And as a result, you know, we now have cross-training Fridays where <laughs> we're... we're where we're actually, awesome. uh, we're it. actually permitted, you know, upper management is finally backing us. I know if the this. pain gets so strong that, enough, then yeah, people are like, yeah, all exactly. right. Yeah, exactly. We have, yeah. so now we have the ability to tell users that their requests may have to wait till Monday because I'm working on some training materials right now and I'm not to be bothered. Yeah. But I'm just, I guess the real question is for, for everyone else <laughs> is how can you, convince your managers that you really need to set aside some time to do this kind of training each other right, like without what's the value? planning a major yeah. disaster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or plan a major disaster. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a really good question. You know, I think that this is something that OpSchool could probably help with. Like they, I'm just going to volunteer them for all the stuff that they should do. Um, uh, but that seems like a great presentation that they as an organization should come up with and and put out there because there there's clearly Etsy values it their management you know decided to uh, basically create a full-time position you know two people half time are working on it uh, to do it so um, you know they could speak to that and I think it would be really interesting to hear from all the other organizations that are contributing to it as well I think that's a really great point sorry I didn't address that in my talk <laughs> thank you Yes. Um, Mark Bartelt from Caltech. Um, I have to admit that I've had a kind of a long time skepticism that sysadmin skills can be taught. I think necessarily, necessary fundamentals can certainly be taught. But I think a large part of what turns an entry level workaday sysadmin into a really good one is on the job learning either from colleagues or on one's own. And in fact, I remember back when SAGE used to be called SAGE, um, the G was really important. I mean, it stood for guild. And it occurred to me at the time that, you know, sysadmitting is a lot like the old medieval craft guilds, where, where junior people come in and they learn from people who've been doing it longer. And in fact, last night at one of the BOF, somebody used the term apprenticeship. And Wow, yeah, that really was the, is the correct term. When, in my experience, when younger people come in, the ones that are open to learning more uh, are the ones who develop into, into better sysadmin. And I brought my laptop because, oh, okay, did I digress for a minute? About a year ago, um, I happened to look at my LinkedIn page for the first time in months and noticed that somebody that used to be with our group had written up a recommendation for me. And I'll refrain from reading the whole thing because it would seem terribly egotistical. But one thing I did want to mention <laughs> that, that he wrote was that um, what I recall is the way he would encourage me to delve into mysteries deep or shallow and actually learn on my own for the sake of teaching the habit and practice of learning on my own that is such a critical asset as a sysadmin. 
uh, da, 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 and was also always willing to lend a hand or engage in a technical discussion, even if it was probably tired ground for him. So this was a kind of mentoring that, you know, I hadn't even realized on a conscious level that I was doing. And yet he benefited and our group benefited because he, he, he became, well, during the years he was there, he became a much better sysadmin. Um, I'm thinking of somebody else now who was with our group for a few years, and it was just a tragedy when he left because he entered as a fairly junior level guy. He had a lot of really good ideas. He learned from the more senior level people just by, you know, hallway conversations, dropping into offices, talking over, you know, coffee or whatever. And at the same time, we learned a lot of stuff from him that he had new fresh ideas that he said, how about doing it this way? And we thought, yeah, that's actually better than what we've been doing. So that's a long sort of rambling um, preface to my question is that how can we encourage more of this? Because in, you know, in my experience, this is where, you know, people come in with a, a computer science background, maybe some sysadminish type coursework, but what really makes the jump from here to there is what everybody learns from their peers. Mm. And how, how can we leverage that? I mean, the, you, you had mentoring up on one of your slides, but uh, mm -hmm. how can we do that more effectively and reach more people and whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have some ideas about that. I have some ideas about mentoring. Um, I, I don't think that that style of mentoring is scalable. Well, exactly, exactly. That was um, my concern, too. It, yeah. it, it doesn't seem scalable, but is there another approach that would uh, address the need for that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the answer comes in identifying, you know, what our core is. You know, what defines us as sysadmins? What are those skills and knowledge that we all need to achieve a certain level? And if we can start sort of like, you know, like the, uh, the frog in the cool water, right? We start raising up the temperature <laughs> and we cook them eventually without them jumping out of the pot. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I think about what we need to do with our educational resources. We need to start thinking about, you know, what's that base level and how do we incrementally build that up so that when someone comes into a work environment like yours, they kind of hit the ground running and they have this base of knowledge so that they're really getting the most out of those mentoring relationships. But fundamentally, I don't think that that style of mentoring is scalable. Well, one thing I was wondering about is uh, our oldest daughter. <laughs> oh, I have a few more people here. How much was, longer can we go? Okay. Pardon Just, me? Uh, Carolyn, how many? 20, 20 more minutes? Awesome. Okay, we're good. Can, can I just ask? Yeah, yeah, wait. go. Okay. Um, our oldest daughter's in med school last year, thinking about where to do a residency. And she, she does, for the past you know, six months, she's been going to other places where she might want to do a residency and basically doing internship is not the right word, but you know, a, a, a six-week rotation where she's learning what other groups do, how they do it differently from what she's been trained and so forth. And I'm wondering what about the possibility of sysadmin education involving, say, six-month internships with groups that could use a junior-level person. Yes. And yes, I think that is a really great idea. So the Rochester Institute of Technology does this. Um, it's part of the core curriculum you have to go and intern somewhere in order to graduate from their program. And um, uh, they really find that it works. So I think that there's precedent for that. And companies that, uh, or universities that have the resources to take on people, I think that's a really great thing to do. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Yes. Hi, uh, David Nolan with Ariba. Uh, before I get to the point that I stood up to make, I want to respond to what he said about you know how do we encourage that level of mentoring. And um, a couple years ago, I got promoted to the the most the, the highest level of technical position in in my IT department. And one of the things my director said to me at that time was, people at that level, a large part of their job in his mind is to raise the level of the rest of the team. Yes. Now Very I'm primarily yeah. a network engineer, but I get assigned off into the SA groups and into you know working with the support team. And my goal is always to try to get everyone else's skill level a little bit higher. So I run internal trainings, but also just kind of poke people. You know, and rather than give them an answer, maybe poke them in the right direction. Yeah. So um, what I stood up to say is Carolyn's comment about. Um, uh, when you hire an engineer straight out of school, you expect them to know nothing. I said I'm a primarily a network engineer right now. I, I equate that to a CCNA, right? 
A CCNA is the lowest level of certification you can get from Cisco. Um, in my mind, it equates to I can plug in cables. <laughs> it's a little bit more than that, but if that's the only thing I really Or at least you don't plug them know, in in a loop, right? You know? Right. Yeah. Or, or that you know that plugging <laughs> them in in a loop is bad. <laughs> okay. But at the same time, that's the lowest level of certification out of Cisco, right? They have geez, yeah, it's all dozens tiered, crazy, yeah. of things these days. And if you look at a conference like Cisco Live, which was in San Diego this year, it was 17,000 people, all of who were taking training. Yep. Right? Because there was hundreds of classes available. There's always more to be learning. Right, and they're scaling that out, right? Like it's, right. yeah. And, and I think the problem I see in, in our community is that that training focuses often too much on the lowest level. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were people at Cisco Live who've been doing Cisco for 20 years, taking training in the latest technology, the next way to do stuff. However, don't get me wrong, the flip side of that is I think Cisco's training sucks. Because <laughs> Cisco's training focuses on here are the bits and what they do. Sure. All right. Here's a configuration setting and what it does. Right. Not why do you care about what this configuration setting does? How does this interact with all of these other configurations? What's the overall goal? And I think that's another thing that's often really missing in the training. Mm. The, the ability to see the big picture. They focus on the, the bits. You don't see the big picture. Yeah, no, I, uh, one of the more fun and interesting conversations I've had with another person that's uh, working on ob school stuff, this guy named Ben, uh, was, you know, how do we get people to take a step back and ask this question, why are we here? You know, like, what, what does it mean to be a professional system administrator? What is my purpose in this company? You know, am I here to make things less expensive? Am I here to ensure five nines of uptime? You know, like, what's, you know, what's my goal here? And how does that, uh, how does that play into my company's goals? So, yeah, I, those are good questions. Hi, my name is Ed Diazzo Kaiser, and I'm not really from any place that's important. <laughs> but um, my question is basically, everyone has a lot of great ideas on what to do, and we have some um, organizations that are actually trying to put out teaching material. But yeah. what do we have as far as a community of people to kind of get together and discuss education of sysadmins in general? Not trying to actually accomplish anything specific, but trying to just get their ideas out there and possibly learn how to do it. Like, Everyone here has great ideas, but how do we get those ideas to people who didn't happen to make Lisa or don't happen to be at these other conferences? Yeah, uh, actually, you know, it sounds like something's happening, Carolyn. Yeah, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think there hasn't been a kind of community of practice coming around this. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's happening now. That would be great. Um, I'm starting to finally meet people who want to, you know, get on a mailing list and hash things out. So, um, it, there may be things out there that exist. You know, if you know of them, please let me know. But it sounds like there are some that are being formed right now. And Carolyn is collecting email addresses. Um, I op school, sure has mine. <laughs> yeah, and op school um, has a mailing list as well. But I, I do think there needs to be, yeah, there, there needs to be a place, right, where we're collecting these conversations and then sharing them. And also, if you have any ideas on um, how to make mentorship scale, I'd be interested in hearing them too. <laughs> Just putting that up. Yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick McLean. I'm from Sony Gaikai. Um, one, we're right now sort of building a very large network that, with lots of redundancy and stuff. And one thing that I've been sort of pushing that we might want to do for a new network is our SREs uh, don't have time to deal with individual system failures. They're more worried about systematic failures. Yep. So one thing that I've been sort of pushing that we might want to do um, with our new network is we can have a team of very junior people, maybe even um, higher people, students during the summertime, who go to all the sort of machines that aren't working, we have no clue why, we don't have time to look into it. And then get them to log in and just sort of figure out what exactly is wrong with that machine so that we can maybe send someone in to swap out the hard drive or the RAM or something. And it's a great way to sort of get people some experience and, you know, 
it doesn't matter if it takes them four times as long as it might take a more senior sysadmin to debug the problem because we don't care. <laughs> The yeah, machine might have been down great, for three months at that point. Yeah, that's a great idea to steal. I mean, this is a kind of a fundamental problem in a lot of the organizations I've worked in. Like, how do you triage the bugs so that the junior people actually have something to do, right? Uh, and that sounds like a great approach. Um, it would be nice if we had like a, you know, list of here's some tricks for um, getting your junior level people to, um, you know, work on lower level bugs. I, I don't think that we've really figured that out, but I, I love that idea. It's great. Hi, I'm Mike Pins. Um, getting back to a degree to one of your earlier points is, I think, really important thing is teaching people how to think. Yeah. My problem with certifications at the moment is over the last 20 plus years, basically the more certification someone has, the less useful they are. <laughs> because today, certifications basically teach you how to, how to regurgitate information. Yeah. And at least today, the people who take a lot of cert classes are basically people who learn by reading books and regurgitating information. Right. They don't actually learn by going, oh crap, this is what's going on, how do I figure out all by myself how to deal with this? Well, and, Which and, with what we do yeah. is really what you need to be able to do to do our job well. Yeah, and, and that's I think the point that the gentleman that was right, right behind you, um, or sitting down, not Steve, but the other guy, um, he made earlier, which is that the certifications that are effective are the ones where people actually have to get in a room with another person and kind of work through a real problem. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree. Certifications that are just like filling in bubbles, that's kind of not super useful. Steve, I think, uh, okay. You guys are so sharing. Oh, okay. So I'm Steve Endemeter with the University of Oregon, and I've actually got now a couple of pent-up comments from. <laughs> um, so the guy from NCAR who was talking about how they had all of this undocumented stuff. Well, you know, one of the things that I do as a teacher is one of the first things that students do in a in a project is they have to create documentation. They learn everything you do. You need to create documentation that's usable by somebody else. It's, yeah. it's when you make the, you know, and as they learned, you know, it, when they didn't have documentation, it's like if you make this a core part of your processes, be, you know, then you will get that documentation. If you just keep going, well, we don't have time to do that and nobody values it enough to do it, then it doesn't happen. Um, and then there was the other comment from the guy who was like, well, you know, sort of the pregnant comment, well, I don't know if it's possible to teach people about system administration. And I always find it ironic when people are coming here to a conference full of other system administrators to learn from other system administrators, and you know, you'd say, "Well, I don't know if it's possible to teach people about this," and like, you're you're here so that other people can teach you about system administration issues, um, you know, and, and which is sort of my answer to like, well, you know. Yes, you can teach people about system administration. It, uh, it is possible, it does work, and you know, a lot of the argument now is just around how can we do it better, how can we get more of it, rather than, well, is this possible? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it is possible to, you know, would you rather have someone who is completely new and has to sort of go through and make all the same mistakes that you know not to do over and over again, would you rather have someone who's been through at least a basic program of here are what we consider to be the best practices in system administration and then, you know, who, who already knows not to make certain mistakes right. and has been trained in basic processes that make them, you know, automatically make them better. Yeah, right. and I think that's a really good distinction, right? They, they, we have this core set of best practices. There are these basic processes that we kind of all know. Like, why aren't we teaching those to everyone? Yeah, we yeah, they're be. like, well, I don't know if you can teach system administration. Yet, if you ask any given system administrator, what's the best way to do this? They will immediately tell you. <laughs> you may get different answers from different people, but <laughs> everyone goes, no, there is a best way to do this, and this is what it is. Right. So, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Yes. Uh, David Klon, uh, small ISP in Wisconsin. Um, and I actually got locked out of David Blank Edelman's uh, talk. I had to step out for a second and the door locked behind me. And I wanted to come to this anyway, so I apologize. I missed the meeting. <laughs> it's cool. I can be second best. It's cool. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I missed the, the beginning and, and the bulk of your presentation. But yep. uh, I, I thought, well, I'm going to put a plug in for him because 
what he's teaching right now, a day over the edge in system administration, is not how to do specific things. There's a little bit of that, but it's really more how to just think outside the box and, and you know, how to use our existing tools for things that you wouldn't have imagined that. And I, that's what I try to do. I'm, I'm kind of a senior level person and I work with a bunch of uh, junior level folks and that's what I try to do when I talk to them is, you know, how can I view this issue, this problem that I'm dealing with in a different way and, and just step back. And that seems to me, I'm, I'm really glad that, that Lisa is doing things like David's talk and this and talking about this stuff because I agree that you know, tr training is, is helpful. You know, how do I uh, type the command to, to do whatnot? But um, it's also, this seems like a, a good crowd of people that, that say, how do we think about things? Yeah, yeah, we have to develop that framework that each bit of yeah, these yeah. specific commands are going to hang in, right? Yeah. Right. And I, I think that's starting to be developed. You know, we're seeing some really great curriculum. I saw a curriculum outline for the Rochester uh, uh, degree program. It's Network and System Administration degree program. And um, it was fantastic. You know, it's all the stuff that you would want someone to know that's going to suddenly be in charge of keeping your systems up, right? Like, it was a really great, great baseline. It's just that the, the list, that list of stuff that they're teaching, it's not something that we all kind of are sharing with each other. It's not something that we're all thinking about. And um, we probably should be spending more time uh, doing that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hey, Theo. Hey. I name, uh, I name checked OmniTI earlier. I don't. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm Theo Schlossnagel from OmniTI. Um, I, I think that um, some frustrating trends that I see in our industry are that um, employers that support education and training um, have an expectation that people come to them fully trained, um, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous. Right. Um, and a lot of people draw parallels between our industry and medicine. And while I think that's it's kind of a poor analogy, um, it, it, there's a very strong metaphor between the two. Um, we, in fact, use a tremendous, uh, tremendously large uh, overlap of, of vernacular between the two. I mean, the pathologies of failure, the complex systems, all of that stuff. And when you look at the education for, um, for like a medical a surgeon, right, the amount of pre, I mean, they spend four years of, of higher education learning about chemistry and things, and then they go learn about anatomy, and they never actually touch a system. They learn all the fundamentals first, and then when they go to touch a system, they spend so long in a hospital doing a residency, doing all of this stuff, and the atmosphere in that hospital is usually very training-centric, very, very educationally focused. They have all of these times where they sit and do round tables with the other with their peers yeah, to the learn. The reflection and the and, yeah. And we have a lot of very similar systems. I mean, when we, when we talk about managing a thousand systems with hundreds of pieces of software, um, I'm not going to say someone dies when we screw up, but 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 it, it, there's a lot of parallels between the two. Mm -hmm. So the expectation that our training processes should be radically more efficient than that, um, I think, is is misplaced. Mm. Right? It, it, it's it's painful. It's a very very long process. Um, and the thing that we're missing is not we need training from industry or we need training from higher education. It's that our hospitals, our our companies, need to do things like the Google SRE University. Right, and, and what I think would be really useful is for companies that have done that internally to dive deep into the case studies around what they've done, how much they've invested in making that, that atmosphere of education um, so central to their actual company um, and, and what they've got from it. And that way, when you talk about like going to your management and saying, I need to do cross-training, like how do I justify that? You have really good documented business material to say, this is how you develop a good organization that has reduced downtime or reduced costs. You build a, 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 an educational atmosphere inside the, in the company. Yeah, no, that's, so. that's an excellent point. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's something that uh, we talked a little bit about in the, the workshop, you know, this idea that maybe the right place to be pursuing the right place to be putting our effort right now is in these master's degree programs and collections of material around that um, instead of trying to get you know, a bachelor's degree or something like that because a lot of the skills that you need, you know, it requires a certain amount of maturity to get there. Um, 
Yeah. I agree. Hi. Hi, I'm Jessica Hilt, and I'm from the University of California, San Diego. Woo! Thanks. Uh, could you take that weather back to Portland? Appreciate that. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna do it. I am actually not a sysadmin. Please don't throw me out. Um, but um, I actually run the UCSD sysadmin certification and training program, um, and it's actually for the employees, not the not the students of UCSD. Uh -huh. um, and just a couple of things. I really loved your talk, and because of course it really pertains to me, but a couple of things that we do um, is we do a certification program that's specific to UCSD sysadmins. Um, we also run a campus LISA. Um, but the thing that I thought um, really, I think, contributes to the overall sense of community at UCSD is we run a sysadmin meeting once a month, and we do talk about corner cases, and we do bring up a lot of things that our sysadmins are running into all the time. And then I have to deal with the fallout of why am I sending my sysadmin to this? I really want them at their desk working. Um, and that's where my role comes in. And, and if I could help you take something back, it's tying the metrics of having a well-trained sysadmin to money um, really helps people understand why a good sysadmin should be going to training programs and steering committees and, and, and LISA events and conferences is if you can tie it to this increases our base level of sysadmin and prevents downtime and helps people uh, learn a lot better and a lot faster. If you can just tie it to a dollar bill, your upper management usually will agree. Yeah, that, yeah it's, it's something I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are working on, you know, return on investment type metrics and, and talking about those things, but I, I don't think that we talk in those terms very often uh, because, you know, they're, you know, like Theo was saying, there's not that many people who talk uh, frankly, about the numbers, you know, what's the effect of this, whether it's good or bad, like when we um, teach, I, I think the effect is that you do end up saving a lot more money because you um, save on that time and you, you end up in an environment that has less failure. But, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of information out there to be shared. Yes. Hey, so just to <clears throat> wrap, uh, that was a really great question because one of the most important things I ever learned as a sysadmin was nothing technical. Uh, I banged my head off a wall for about a year in a previous company trying to get 400 bucks for a decent raid card for a mail server, and it was just we don't need we don't need it. It's working fine. We don't have the money, um, and I, I just got really really frustrated and angry. We were doing all sorts of crazy stuff like putting the mail queue into a RAM disk and stuff. To we we know we probably would lose emails, but it was just all to kind of get performance so the mail server wouldn't crash. And then uh, our I, I just mentioned it one night while we were out for drinks with the CFO, and he went. Come up to my desk and, and just tell me why you need the money. So I went up and I was trying to explain to him. And he said, yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? Do you have any graphs? I went, oh, I've got loads of graphs. So I went back and made up a, a sheet of all the reasons why the mail server was important to us. And it was things like, we have 35,000 customers paying $2 a month for this. Uh, blah. And it ended up, you know, the, the CFO had a look and went, hold on, we're making $150,000 a year on a single mail server? How much did it cost us? Uh, $1,000. <laughs> yeah. It's easy, if right? We, yeah. If we give you another 500, <laughs> we can, keep, we can add, you know, I, I can add like five times as many users. Oh, can you take $5,000? It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I replaced it with a mail cluster. And he said, yeah, you need to show me these graphs every month. And we're going to have a chat on the return on investment. Yeah. I've never done anything like that before. Certainly, we would never done anything like that in university. And it was the single most important lesson of my life. Yeah, that's really good. Well, we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. That was an awesome discussion. So if, thanks for having me. If you're interested in contributing positively and you have anything you think could be actionable other than just venting or whatever, you can email me at unpixie at gmail.com, and I will add you to the discussion. Thanks.